if you have this narrative of for this action to matter, their reaction has to happen. You're setting a conditional philosophy of my happiness is predicated on their response. You're living externally. You'll never have validation. You'll never have the feeling you need because you're all basing everything off something you can't control. How did you uh, hear about us? So you, you, you sent us a Instagram. message. Instagram. Right? Yeah, Instagram, Instagram. And I always watch people's podcasts to see like, there's so many people who don't get discovered. Sure. You know, and me struggling with the way I came about, I was a one man army. So I had to figure out how to get my name out there. And I back ended myself as like a D list celebrity and okay. built my career based on that. Like yeah. faked myself as a celebrity. So yeah, sometimes that's what you, what it takes. You got to believe you make it. Yeah. Take it till you make it. Too. it no, like literally I, I like lived that. To the point where I got on that TV show and did a bunch of stuff, and it was it was crazy. So yeah, you were on the what is Titan, it? Titan, Titan Games? yeah, Titan Games with the Rock. With, with yeah. How? That is, How? Bro, they reached out to me. I thought it was fake. I wasn't even gonna go. I could, this buddy called me at like eleven at night. He's like, "We want to do a video interview with you." I'm like, "I'm not going on no black couch. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> third <laughs> couch. You know? Yeah. yeah. I was like, "Nah." But uh, he was like, "Oh, we're doing this show with the with the Rock." I'm like, "Okay." And they reached out to me. There was like two hundred thousand people that applied for this show. Wow. They gave yeah, me an opportunity know. to compete for a spot against 200 people. They flew me out to LA. I went home. I was like, there's no way. I'm a power lifter. Like, I lift heavyweight, yeah. but that's it. They were like, we chose you and we're going to use you for all the marketing. So I was on the bus, I was on the billboards at The Rock and did all this stuff. And it was crazy, man. That's that so cool. insane. Yeah, so wild. you met him and oh, yeah, he was cool as hell. He was super cool. He, super cool. he seems like a nice guy. Bro, he comes in a room, you talk, and he leaves. He's like, oh, that was The Rock. Like, he doesn't talk down to you at all. Yeah. Super cool, dude. That's awesome, man. So, I mean, just for for people to understand a little bit about yourself, kind of maybe we usually start with people giving them like an, an introdu introduction about who they are, yeah. where they're from. So just kind of people have an idea of who you are. For sure. If you want to kind yeah. of just kind of bring in. So uh, I was born with a physical disability. Okay. And for 17 years, I hid my disability up until maybe four years ago. How old are you? I'm 31 now. Okay. Oh, my God. So I hid my disability for the majority of my life. Just because I wasn't comfortable with the way I looked, the way I felt. And, you know, I grew up in a poor area uh, in Pompano. And uh -huh. uh, it was a struggle being different. Mm -hmm. And I didn't accept myself for a very long time. So I really don't even consider living a good life until I finally accepted myself a few years ago. Then I created a career for myself. I went to school for exercise science because I thought I wanted to build muscle. Okay. Yeah. I, bro, I wanted to get girls. Let's be honest. Like, <laughs> I, I thought that was the key. Like, abs was the key. Yeah. Right. And I got abs and I'm like, why am I still not happy? Yeah. You know? So I became a personal trainer. I was like, I'm still not happy. I built my own business online. I'm like, this is cool, but I, I still feel like I'm missing something. Right, right. And I found speaking, and now I'm a professional speaker. I built a speaking business around the world, and I help people see their world without limits. And now I'm finally feeling fulfilled because it's not about what I'm earning. It's about what I'm giving. Mm. And sometimes you teach best what you need to learn most, and that like changed my life. That is true. You teach best what you need. Yeah, that is so true. Um, so you you uh, you you grew up and uh, you you so it's a type type one diabetes. I have type one diabetes. I got that at nineteen. So I I struggled having a disability, you know, my entire life because I was born this way. Okay. But I got uh, an autoimmune disease, type one, at nineteen, and that was like the trigger, the catalyst for me to be like, I can't be this disabled diabetic kid. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That can't that can't define you. It can't. And the can't bad thing be. is like. If you think about some some of the synonyms for disability, it's like weak or broken or useless or helpless. Like you almost define people with disabilities mm -hmm. as less than, you know? Yeah. You see a guy with a disability opening a bag of chips and you're like, wow, that's so motivating. <laughs> is it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you just, you okay. just wanted some damn chips, you know? Yeah. Or you, you, there, people feel automatically feel sorry for you, yeah. feel bad for you. Or they feel like, more inspired because I'm doing something. They're like, true. I've had so many people come up to me. And they're like, oh, man, that's so crazy. I can't even do that. And I'm like, well, you can't do that because you didn't spend your entire life training for it. Mm. You know, it's not because you're not disabled. It's because you don't right. put in the effort. <laughs> yeah, it's because it you don't have the work ethic like I do. So I had to deal with that for a long time. So I kind of pursued fitness as a way to be competitive. Right. And I got into powerlifting and I got to the point where I was competing against normal body competitors, you know. Yeah. And I got to the point where I broke a world record. I broke four state records. and it's insane. It was cool, but Congrats. it was like, Damn. There's so many people that doubted me because of a condition I never asked for. Mm -hmm. So what do, what do I get to do to make a, a life full of purpose? Or how do I get to turn this life around and like deal with the cards that I was dealt, you know, and I found a way and it's just, it comes through choice and the way you help people and the way you position yourself. And it, it's the narrative that you give yourself. And for so long I had a bad narrative and right. that's with anything in life, you know, True. we give ourselves a bad narrative and yeah. I'm sure you've been there, whether it's relationships, professional, personal, yeah. You know? 
um, not when you when you were breaking these records and you were, you were doing all these things, were you feeling like, man, like I I've, I've proven this to them, or Proved what was it to yourself? Yeah, well, was there? I'm sure there must have been like a lot of satisfaction. Was it more centered about yourself, or like these people doubted me and I still made it? I still did what everybody said I couldn't do. How was that for you? I think the hardest thing for me was uh, I went too far, too extreme. I had a hard time uh, appreciating anything. Mm. Satisfaction is the death of desire. And that that phrase was burned into my head. So the second I broke a record or the second I did something that was notable to other people, I wouldn't say, wow, that was great. I would say, what's next? Mm. So I got addicted to more. I got addicted to abundance. And it, our society is big on that. That is true. Yeah. And it sucked because there's so many things that I did that seemed cool on paper, but I never really got to like feel it until I took a step back from everything. And I was like, I'm allowed to feel proud. I'm allowed to enjoy what I've done. I'm allowed to say, wow, that that's awesome, you know, but for so long I didn't allow myself to do that. And we do that all the time. You accomplish amazing things. And sometimes getting out of the bed is a like, huge accomplishment, yeah. but we say, oh, it's not enough. It's never enough. It's that narrative we just talked about. It's the narrative in your head that you constantly tell yourself, I need to do more or something's off or I should be doing this or I shouldn't be doing that. That narrative determines quality of life for everything. And that's why I wrote that book about like self-communication because I was like, Everyone says communication is key. Mm. You know, communication is key. That's step two because self-communication is key. How do you expect someone to communicate with you when you don't know how to communicate with you? How are we skipping that step? Why are we having expectations of other people that we're not willing to do ourselves? doesn't make sense. That's literally like what our focus is. Yeah. <laughs> like That's why sentences. I love yeah. this because I was like, oh, man, this is like so aligning with where you guys – like what you feel about mental health and everything. So literally before you came here, I had texted him and I was like, Hey, I'm excited for, for our guest because I, you know, I saw his videos. I read it on his article. He has a book and everything like that and his website. And it's like everything he embodies is what we embody. You know what I mean? So being able to bring you on and have that kind of conversation and, and, you know, knowing that, yeah, you have a disability, but it's not a disability. Yeah. You know, if anything, it kind of empowers you. It's like, Hey, you're complaining about whatever you're complaining about. And it's like, What's stopping you? You know, only you are stopping yourself. It's that story. So it's that mindset that yeah. you're kind of, you were able to put yourself in. And now it's like, you want to help everyone else to get there as well. There's no excuses to, to anything. It's, it all comes down to you and what your belief is and what you can accomplish. So the fact that you're kind of sending that message for us, it was like, man, this is going to be Yeah, amazing. it's like inspiring. And like we were watching the, you, you know, your videos on YouTube and stuff like that. And it's like, man, like this guy just embodies like self-confidence and, and motivation, inspiration. So the fact that you're a, a keynote speaker, it makes 100%, it makes sense to me because like, I think you walk into a room and, and people probably gravitate towards you and the things that you say and the things that you've overcome it's it's a big step and for a lot of people and i think i always we always, i always say it, it's like the biggest thing you could do for to me personally is making an impact in somebody else's life 100% especially if they been in a position where they felt helpless or they felt like there's no way out and we always talk about it there's always another option there's always another day there's always there's always light at the end of the tunnel but for a lot of people when they're in that position they don't see it that way so it's, I think it's, it's an amazing experience. I'm sure you've had it plenty of times when you, you know, had helped some people out and they're like, hey, thank you for what you said or what you did. So I think that's a great feeling. And I always say it's, it's so important to have that. I think people have to understand when you say the, the biggest thing is having impact, mm. the biggest thing is having impact, but it doesn't have to be big things. And that's where people confuse. You don't have to go on a TV show. You don't have to write a, a book. You don't have to have a professional podcast. If you want to feel good, if you're down on yourself, the biggest way to have impact is go to the gas station and hold the door open for someone. You want to have even bigger impact? Go to the gas station, hold the door open for them, and don't expect them to say anything. Do it because you wanted to help. Mm. Help an old lady up a stair. You know, big impact doesn't have to be big things. You know, and people confuse that. You don't have to be in front of thousands and thousands of people. I'm also thinking that it's it's it all comes down to the expectation, I think. Because if you're going with the expectation of some sort of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Reward or... Rewarding recognition. Like you're doing it, expecting to get something from the other person rather than you doing it from yourself. And then, because now we're putting ourselves up to disappointment if we don't get the expectation, if that expectation is not met from our actions. But when you're able to do it yourself because you want to do it, that's a whole different side Mm. of you know, accomplishing something because you did it for you, not with that expectation of getting it from someone that, else. That's massive. It comes down to the narrative. If you have this narrative of for this action to matter, their reaction has to happen, 
you're setting a conditional philosophy of my happiness is predicated on their response. You're living externally. You'll never have validation. You'll never have the feeling you need because you're all basing everything off something you can't control. And I also feel like that's a huge problem, especially in dating, because we always we've had uh, other guests that we've talked about that it's like they jump from relationship to relationship, never fully feeling healed together within themselves. It's always like they're looking for someone else's, their validation. That was the word I was looking for. Mm. Someone else, external validation. Rather than finding that within yourself, being happy with who you are and what you bring to the table, what you've accomplished, what are the, everything that you embody, it's, it's special in its own way. And for you to have to feel like someone else has to accept you, you know, that's where we're wrong on that one. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Before we continue, we just want to say thank you for supporting us and we hope you enjoy the show so far. As you know, we're going like crazy. So we want to give you guys more content, but we're very limited on what it is that we can put on social media, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Spotify, it's all that good stuff. We got to battle their algorithm. So we do want to move a lot of over our content to Patreon where we have more control to really interact with you guys and give you guys what it is that you want. So moving forward, the audio full episodes will still be available on Spotify and iTunes, but we are going to be changing things up when it comes to the video to put it on Patreon. Mm-hmm. Now, stick around to the end of the episode where we'll talk a little bit more about Patreon. You can see what it is that we're doing, but we have full control to really interact with you guys and give you guys what it is that you want. So again, thank you guys so much for watching. That being said, enjoy the show. Peace. It's how you accept yourself to then for you to put that person out in front for then they can be like, oh, that's who they are which is why I talk about self-communication. And I was actually listening to one of the podcasts on the way here uh, about mental health and from the therapist you guys had recently, I think in Ing- February. Which one? In- Ingrid? Or- yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, she was so awesome, So yeah. someone, I don't know if it was one of you, I, th- I believe it was one of you said uh, the phrase, easier said than done. Uh-huh. Yeah. That phrase gets us in a lot of trouble. <laughs> and here's why. Easier said than done, 100% true, but better done than said. That is what we need to come down to because it's easier said than done to go to work. I'd rather not, you know, it's easier said than done to make your bed. It's easier said than done to do all these things. And people are like, no, 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 I have to go to work. No, you don't. You could be homeless. <laughs> you could lose everything you own. You could, but you turned a desire to not be homeless into a necessity. And if you have the ability to turn a desire into a necessity with something, you can do it with anything, whether that's maintaining your boundaries, whether that's maintaining your value whether that's, you know, giving your all, being authentic, those are choices. Easier said than done, absolutely, but better done than said. It's almost like, uh, didn't Steve Harvey have a saying that it's um, changed the way that you say or like how you think of an action? So, for example, damn, I have to go to work today. Yep. Rather than mm, I get to. to go to, yes. yeah, you know? Yeah. So that, you're already changing the, the narrative and now you're changing your mindset to whatever action it is. So instead of you thinking like, man, I got to go do this, it's like, I actually have the chance to do this. Yeah. Not, not anyone can say that, it's, but I can do it. It always comes back to that narrative. And it's so important because if we put this narrative of no one loves me, we put this narrative of no one can please me, this narrative of uh, every person I'm with sucks. We're so bound to what happened in our past that we're repeating it. We're, we're literally reliving the stuff we say mm-hmm. we don't like because yeah. we're choosing to say, this is just how I've always been. Jesus. This is how I've always been. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> who you have been doesn't have to be who you are. Oh, 100%. And, but people live by that. It, that's just how I do it. No, that's how you did it. And that's how you're choosing to do it. That's the narrative you're taking from the past and applying to now. Because you can't fix what you did, but you're actively recreating it. And that's on you. Responsibility, and not just responsibility, but responsibility. <laughs> Your ability to respond is kind of important and the bad thing is we're blaming and pointing fingers at everyone i don't have enough fingers to point at all the people i wanted to blame (laughs) you know but the one that i do have it was me it was always me and it wasn't until i said my value is my value regardless of what happens around me or to me it's my choice easier said than done but better done than said yeah i was talking uh, to someone the other day and um she was sharing with me how she was very frustrated with how someone else was handling something and I'm like, well, have you ever thought of it doing it this way? Like change the way that you do it. No, no, no. But that's just how they are. Well, no, 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 no. That's, that's not just, how they are. that's what you've allowed to mm-hmm. happen. Yes. You've accepted that. Yes. So you cannot control what they do, but you can also react the same way, expecting them to change how they do it. No, you're in control of what you can do. So you handle that on yourself. Because for example, they can do whatever they want. You can't control, I'm so sorry. I'm no, 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 cutting you off and stuff. You can't control, you know, what they do, but you can control your response to those Always. actions. Always, that's the one thing what you they can. Say. Exactly. So it, that w- really hit me because at the end of the day, you can only handle yourself, but also comes in with you having that self-communication 100%. to have that, like, that, that strength to do so. 
Yeah. If that made sense. Man, I love that. You know, 100%. It's, it, it's really up to the individual in itself. And every day you have to make choices. And, and you could turn your, your life around every day. And it's, it's just so important to kind of take that into perspective. I think people just like to be comfortable with the choices that they make. And it's like, oh, it's always been this way. Well, it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it feels easier sometimes to just kind of keep doing the same thing that you were doing, your parents were doing, their parents were doing. And you kind of sometimes get stuck. So I think it's important for some people to kind of step outside that and look at it from an outside perspective. Okay, sure. what is going on? And do I really enjoy the direction my life is going? If the answer is yes, that's great. If the answer is no, well, then put some action behind that, you know? And so I think that's important. You said the word comfort, and I, I love that. I have a concept in my book. It's called Don't Touch the Hot Stove. We get so comfortable with pain. We'd prefer pain that we know rather than the unknown of fear. So people would rather be hurt the same way by the same person just because they know the capacity of pain versus leaving them for the fear of the unknown. There's a possibility that it could be worse, but there's a likelihood that it would be better. Would be better. Mm -hmm. But that possibility of unknown or that possibility of worse makes them run back to the comfort mm -hmm. of pain that they know. You know, the devil you know, so to speak. Yeah. And yeah. people get comfortable with that. I've learned to accept. I've learned to deal with. I've learned to, you know, live this way. So it's not that bad. So we live in this purgatory of it's not as good as we want it to be, but it's not bad enough to change. It's tolerable. Tolerable. And life should not be tolerable. Life mm -hmm. doesn't have to be enjoyable all the time, but it damn sure shouldn't be tolerable. Mm -hmm. Contentment is what we need. And if you're not content with your situation, we need to change something, whether the way we perceive it or the way we go about it, reaching out for help. There are certain situations that require, you know, uh, intervention, whether it's domestic violence or anything like that. But in terms of acceptance, you teach people how to treat you. Mm. you Whatever you people. allow them, that, that's what's going to continue. A hundred percent. You don't deserve anything. You deserve what you allow. And that's a hard, hard truth. Mm. You deserve what you choose to put up with. And that's, it sucks. You know, it's one of those like hard hitting facts, but you got to position yourself to understand your value. You got to position yourself to set boundaries. And if you teach them that breaking boundaries is okay, you're teaching them how to treat you. But how, how do, how would you, um, help someone think that? Because I'm thinking of, you know, we start off with the relationships. Now we talk about almost anything, but I can see how, for example, let's, let's, use the examples of, of a relationship, a, a woman who's probably unhappy with her man and stuff, but she stays, right? Because she's comfortable with what she knows and she's afraid to leave because she doesn't know what's up, what else is going to be out there. Mm. How would you be able to, in this scenario, in any scenario, how do you kind of guide or coach them for them to kind of find that within themselves again? So how do you know what's on the outside of this door? Got to go through it. Got to open the door. And you're probably not afraid because more than likely you've already told yourself a story that it's okay. But if you told yourself the story that there's three armed men aiming at the door, that door is not opening. You're not opening the door. Mm. The narrative is everything. And the bad thing is people confuse feelings with facts. Feelings are not facts. If you feel like you're not going to find something out there, that's not a fact. That's just the story you told yourself with the emotional lacing of my comfort is so deep that anything to shake that is not worth experiencing. So you convince yourself You've to believe your fact. And if you convinced yourself, you can unconvince yourself. We need to not just break up with the people who wrong us, but break up with the feelings that wrong us. And for so long, those feelings that wrong us are told by us. If you wanted to get better at tennis, you wouldn't practice basketball, you know, <laughs> specificity is everything. So if you want to get better at learning your value, learning your boundaries, you have to practice that. Self-communication comes back to that. Mm. Just because you tell yourself a story doesn't mean it's true. And just because you tell yourself a story doesn't mean you can't change it. It takes effort. It's hard. Yes. But it is relatively simple. It takes consistent practice over time. We can't expect to upend the uh, lack of optimal mental health that we've instilled in ourselves. But it starts with a single step. You know, it takes effort on your part. It doesn't have to be perfect. But so many people say, because I can't be at the finish line now, I'm not going to train for the race. Yeah. Everyone wants to hang out at the finish line without running the race, mental health, business relationships. Everyone wants to have the perfect, you know, white picket fence marriage. Everyone All wants right. to have the million dollar podcast. Everyone wants to have this, but no one wants to suck. No one wants to struggle. It sucks. It does suck. Yeah. But you ha growth is the exciting part. The finish line is the, uh, you know, that's the effect of growth, mm. but people are uncomfortable with change. They're uncomfortable with uncertainty and they're uncomfortable with growth 
Because growth hurts. I feel like there's also, there's so much more reward knowing that you had to go through that journey rather than just hanging out on the finish line. But I I also think that that's, but you have to learn, I guess you have to go through those obstacles and overcome an obstacle yourself to be like, wow, Mm -hmm. like this feels so much different than if I would have just, you could say, oh man, I wish I lived in that condo, which trust me, of course I'd love to live in a beautiful condo over seeing the beach, but knowing if I can build, like what did I go through to get there? I feel like that's so much more rewarding of that journey to overcome everything to, in order to, to get there. I think there's beauty in the journey and I go with the process in itself, even though it's- Juices it's, in the journey. Juices in the journey, yeah. We had someone say that. <laughs> uh, shout out to Dr. Dr. Hisi. Um, but I think the struggle in itself is, is I think what what makes us human or what's make, what, what makes the journey really rewarding. And, and you can apply that to anything. And uh, just if you could just snap your finger and just have everything you wanted, would it be really that rewarding? No, you would just, it would just be mundane. And it'd just eh, be- whatever. Yeah, exactly. It would, kind of not really appreciate it as much. But when you work your way up the ladder and, and going through the struggle and the, and, and the pain and the agony, and you make it and you look back, man, I really overcame this. I really got through this, whether it is school, your relationships, uh, your business, your finances, whatever it is, looking back, is a, it's a beautiful thing. You it know? really is. And, and I think people, people say they want things, but... I'm okay with wanting things as long as you're honest with yourself. I would love to have a penthouse on that condo. I also know I'm not going to do right now what it takes to get that. I'm going to be honest with myself. I'm currently not dedicating my life to get that penthouse. Yes, it would be nice to just kind of have maybe, but like I know I'm not going to put in the work for that. My life path is where my life path Mm -hmm. is, and that's what I'm focused on. So don't lie to yourself and say you want things you aren't willing to work for, you know? Mm -hmm. You can't, you, you got, because you're just creating more stress in your life. You're, you're creating extra stuff that you're not even doing anything about. It's like trying to drive the car from the back seat. You're not, (laughs) you know, you need to take control and say, okay, what am I actually going to do? If you're not actually going to do it, it doesn't have space in your head because we have such a limited capacity now, even driving here. I'm like looking at all the billboards, the cars are so much, and I'm listening to you, the podcast and there's so much sensory overload. Focus on what you can control. Stop telling yourself all these little things. You know, if you truly wanted it, you could, if you wanted to, but be honest, it's not a urgent, it's not a priority right now. What is, and focus on that, you know? Man, I like that. This is insightful, man. Thank you so much. Like, cause I, and, and this is, this is the beauty of what we do, what we do is just to bring on people and have these discussions because there's so many people out there who can, who can relate or, or who maybe they don't have the type of people in their life that, that could install that kind of wisdom onto them. And so I think this is kind of what we started this and, and, and really making an impact, helping people regardless if it's just one person or a hundred or whatever it is. And and that's kind of the, the journey that we're on right now. I and love that, that. Yeah. And there's a lot that we have, you know, we, we have so many goals and visions and stuff like that, but sometimes <laughs> we got to take a step back and, and be appreciative and, and be grateful for where we are versus where we started and then where we're going. So, I wanted to ask you, Chris, um, kind of shift gears a little bit. What was your upbringing like, like when you were born? Because so you were born with uh, I was born with a physical disability. I hate calling it a disability because it's, okay, yeah. it's like it's not. You know, it's like, like I have a disability, but I'm not disabled. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. But so you were born like this. So how was it growing up? Like, did you have any obstacles for for yourself? Maybe to um, as you grew up, maybe physical obstacles, or then I guess your upbringing, like maybe with your family as well as friends. How how was that growing up? So. I definitely, I grew up in a a pretty crappy area, but like I grew up with the people I grew up with. So they knew me as that's just how I was. People made fun of my hand, but I just thought that's just what it was, you know, that that's how I live. And I tried to pretend like I was hard, you know, and uh, I ended up learning to hide my hand. Uh, Specific case, there was a girl named Crystal and I was in middle school and I was like, I'm going to ask this girl out, you know, like it's going to be my first girlfriend. I got the courage to go in front of the class and ask her out. And I went up to her desk and all my friends were laughing. I turned around, I'm like, stop, you know, I'm like, I'm about to get this girl. I turn around and she's making fun of my residual limb with a stapler calling me claw boy in front of the whole class. Cause that's the two fingers I have on my residual limb. And I shoved my hand in my pocket and I kept it there for almost 10 years. Jeez. And when I say that people are like, Oh, you hid your hand. No, I, when I went to Washington DC for a school field trip, I almost got arrested because I refused to take my hand out of my pocket. I swam in the ocean with my hand in my pocket. I did the PE test with my hand in my pocket. I got in my first fight, uh, with my hand in my pocket and I lost because I would rather get hit and lose 
and expose. take my hand out of my pocket. So I'm very used to body image issues or anything like right. that. And I understand what it feels like, you know, by the same token, you guys have the exact same story as me. You went through some shit, you got over some shit and more shit's coming, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Right. So when you break down everyone's story to the bare bones, we all have a very similar story, but so Sometimes we want to say, oh, but I had it worse. Like it's a competition. You know, yeah, like that's true. you you want me to relieve the responsibility of you making your story better by comparing it to mine. And I could tell my story any way I want. I could tell you a story and make you guys tear up. I could tell you a story and make you laugh with the same story. Mm -hmm. The only difference was my perspective and my choice on how I tell it to you guys and how I tell it to myself. But this was recent. This was kind of recent when you kind of opened up again. It was. So about four years ago, uh, I was still hiding my disability. I wore In a glove. Oh. I, yeah, I wore a glove over my hand. Okay. And I was just known as the guy with the glove, you know? Uh, I played drums. I did martial arts. I did all kinds of stuff. I shoved a drumstick through the finger hole of a glove and played four years on my drum line. <laughs> like, really? Yeah, I did everything you could to the point where people grew to accept my discomfort as confidence. I got so comfortable being fake confident, yeah. hiding in front of... I hid in plain sight. Yeah. A lot of people do that. You see people smile like that's the happiest person I've ever seen. You don't know that. That's just a story you told yourself about them. Mm. Robin Williams, people like that. You never know. You never know what people are struggling with. For me, I my confidence was a way to hide my depression. It was a way to hide my anxiety. And I lived that way for a very long time. And I told myself, uh, I don't think I'm ever going to stop hiding my disability unless I get a prosthetic arm, which it's almost impossible. This is $150,000. So very expensive. Yeah. So the likelihood of getting approved for this in the United States is very hard. One day I finally got it approved and I'm a man of my word. So I decided to make a YouTube video, basically my coming out video, like taking the glove off that went viral on Reddit and YouTube. Washington Post covered it. Uh, eventually the rock reached out with the TV show. Uh, and from that day I was, I was thrown in the deep end and it was the best thing that could ever happen. Cause I got thousands of messages, people saying, Oh, I'm uncomfortable. I'm unconscious. You know, I'm self-conscious about this. Or mm. it made me realize not only was I not alone, I had a job to do. Like I vow to be the person I never really had growing up to help me see my value for what it is. And I, I talk about it on stage all the time. When I get hired to do events, if you saw a hundred dollar bill on the ground and it was crumpled up and dirty, you'd pick that shit up. <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. you wouldn't be like, uh, don't like that one. Cause you recognize the value, but the second we have a defect mentally, physically, emotionally in ourselves, we're like, uh, my value is less. I'm no longer a hundred. I'm 80. That girl broke up with me. I'm 60. Yeah. Yeah. I can the see the only difference was you decided to lower your value because you're the only one that can set that bar. And when you set that bar, you live your life accordingly to the story that you placed on yourself. Jeez. I, yeah. I, I wanted, I, what I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about, um, you, you said, coincidentally, you said breakup. How, how was dating for you when you were younger? And even maybe even now, like, have you ever had any struggles? Cause you were so for a while you were, you were afraid of what people thought of you. How did that impact your, your dating? Wait, but, before asking. you go into that, is that why you were, were you always into fitness? No, I got into fitness right after I got diagnosed with diabetes at 19. Oh, so, so you did it more for the health? Sign or? I, I did it because uh, it's just super competitive. I was like, I can't be this disabled diabetic yeah. kid. So I have to like do something. And then someone told me, you know, you can't really work out because you're a one handed guy living in a two handed world. Like machines are made for not you. And I found a way I adapted. So uh, I wanted to be a bodybuilder, you know, for so long. I saw the magazines and stuff. And yeah. It took a long time. So in the middle of trying to bodybuild, I ended up found powerlifting. That's where I got competitive, getting up to a 675 pound deadlift. And then I finally got big enough to do my first bodybuilding show last year. Yeah, I saw the pictures. Yeah. Nasty. It was crazy. Yeah. But after 15 years, you know, I ended up winning first place and it was cool, but it's like, damn, I, I accomplished that goal. And for me, the stage, the trophy, it's a $5 trophy. I could buy it myself if I All wanted right. to. Yeah. It, it was like every kid who lived that life that I was, you know, saw me and they're like, maybe I can. And that maybe I can moment is what drives me like every day, you know? You know, I, I was wondering because, um, because obviously you growing up and, and, and with the disability, I, it, it's almost like, well, maybe you tried to compensate for it. Definitely. There was lots of oh, overcompensation for sure. It, to the point where like anything I did was competitive. If I, like I skateboarded, I wanted to be the best skateboarder. It's almost like I never felt enough. So I had to prove to everyone around me that I was, you know, really? and 
that extremist of wanting to be successful, wanting to be seen as successful, I was fighting for other people's acceptance, even if I already had it, just because I wouldn't give it to myself. But I wanted to control the way people thought about me. And like yeah. that, that's a very manipulative thing to try and control how people see you, you know, because I, I could have let that aside and be like, how do I see myself? I would have lived a lot more quality of life in my head. I still did stuff that might've helped people, but if I could go back, I would start from the ground up. I wouldn't start building the roof and work yeah. my way down, you know? Mm. No, cause I'm thinking, cause it's almost like you would do all, all of that. It would almost bring more attention to you yet you would hide hiding in plain sight was my thing. I performed, I was a dancer for a long time. Uh, this guy did everything, <laughs> everything, but sports. I'm the only guy that doesn't like sports. I swear to God, really? I've got a degree in exercise science and I, I hate sports. It's really weird, but I, I danced, I did uh, martial arts, drumming, anything creative. Um, but I would perform in front of my school yeah. and it's almost like I got ahead of the eyes. Yeah. Make you look at me because of what I'm doing, not because of how I look. Mm, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I redirected the narrative away from it and I made it so uncomfortably comfortable for people. No one would dare ask me. I never had people ask me about my hand. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching this episode. If you enjoyed this content, please head over to Patreon where you'll be able to watch the full episode, get exclusive content and watch all of our episodes at an earlier time. Yeah. So uh, coffee break up started, you know, being a short little break within your day, whether morning, afternoon, night for you to get, you know, your information, 30 minutes, nice and easy. But obviously as we're expanding more guests, more episodes, longer episodes, we want to make sure that we can put that in the middle, little space for those who really want to enjoy those episodes. So head on over to Patreon where you can subscribe for a small little fee. It'll help us continue expanding our business and giving you that same content that you guys really want to follow us for. So again, thank you guys so much for everything. We couldn't have done it without you, but again, head on over to Patreon, check us out, see if it kind of tickles your fancy and we appreciate your support we love you guys thank you guys later